Well, just a reminder now that if you'd like to ring in and cast your votes for an act on Bob Says Opportunity Knocks, the numbers are listed on page 30 of the Radio Times and page 146 on CFAX. In 15 minutes, there's more from the arm of the law, this time on the 14th Precinct with Cagney and Lacey. But now on one, the news and sport from Jan Leeming and Michael Peshart. <laughs> Gorbachev greets Mrs. Thatcher in the Kremlin. Harvey Proctor wins the support of his local constituency party. Oxford defeat the odds and the weather. And Prince Charles learns to dance the Swazi way. Mrs. Thatcher has begun her visit to the Soviet Union. She arrived in Moscow this afternoon and has already had one meeting with Mr. Gorbachev. Talks will begin in earnest on Monday when arms control and human rights are expected to top the agenda. Tonight, Mrs. Thatcher said she and Mr. Gorbachev had real issues to discuss. It wasn't, she said, a question of polite diplomatic minuets. The RAF PC-10 arrived to a full-dress welcome. Mrs. Thatcher's host here is the Soviet Prime Minister, Mr. Rishkov, and he was waiting for her at the aircraft steps. Mrs. Thatcher stepped out to meet him, fur-hatted against the still freezing temperatures of a Moscow spring. The reception was formal and polite. There was even a touch of gallantry, red roses for an iron lady, and a Pravda biography that left out her age. Pravda, the Communist Party newspaper, hoped that the visit would promote trust and stability in Europe and international security. But the official goodwill is being matched by some sharp criticism. A commentary from TASS said Britain ranked 17th in economic terms among industrial nations, but was leading them in the growth of crime. These hostile comments are a response to Mrs. Thatcher's recent critical remarks on Soviet human rights. But after her motorcade had taken her to the British Embassy, the Prime Minister chose to emphasise a different aspect of her interest in the Soviet Union. The things are are changing. Uh, and Mr. Gorbachev made a series of fascinating speeches and obviously is, is wanting to change uh, some things in the Soviet Union. And then it is a time when there's a feeling that we may be able to get arms control agreements at the same time as keeping the security of the West and of course the security of the Soviet Union so that we all have security at a lower level of weaponry. I know that Mr. Gorbachev uh, will be absolutely frank and will deal with the issues. It's not a question of polite diplomatic minuets. We've got real issues to deal with. And we know, both know that uh, the other one will be frank and courteous and seeking always to be constructive. The first meeting with Mr. Gorbachev came tonight in the Kremlin Palace. It was brief but jovial sufficient for the Soviet leader and his wife to welcome Mrs. Thatcher to their country. The formal talks don't begin until Monday, but this visit is planned less to obtain specific agreements than to give two influential leaders a chance to assess each other, and few moments will be wasted. The SDP leader, David Owen, has strongly condemned the Labour Party's defence policies and particularly Neil Kinnock's handling of his talks with President Reagan. Mr. Kinnock arrived home today to criticism, not only from Dr. Owen, but in the press as well. At the Welsh SDP conference, David Owen accused the Labour leader of damaging relations with the United States and NATO. This was a stinging attack on Mr. Kinnock in the wake of his meeting with President Reagan. The Labour leader had described the meeting as genial. White House officials were less enthusiastic. In Wales, Dr. Owen exploited the hostile reaction, saying that while Labour had a non-nuclear defence policy, Mr. Kinnock was unfit to be Prime Minister. There is probably no other politician in this country, other than Mr. Tony Benn, who has done more to harm Anglo-American friendship and to undermine commitment to NATO. And it's humbug to pretend otherwise. The fact is that Mr. Kinnock has got his comeuppance on his visit to Washington and to New York, and he richly deserved it. 
While Dr Owen put the knife into labour and made much of the alliances overhauling them in the latest opinion poll, Brian Gould, Labour's election campaign coordinator, was busy attacking Mrs Thatcher. The Prime Minister's declared aim of eliminating socialism, he said, was another example of her efforts to stifle dissent. What she means by her assault on socialism is an assault on the values and interests of millions of people who do not necessarily think of themselves as socialists, but who will be appalled at the vision of society which Mrs Thatcher has for them. Mr Gould insisted that only Labour had the policies to defeat Mrs Thatcher. So, as the season of personal attacks continues, it won't just be the Conservative chairman, Norman Tebbit, who'll be watching carefully to see what effect they may have on party popularity. A Conservative MP has fought off an attempt to deselect him after allegations about his private life. Harvey Proctor, the MP for Billericay in Essex, won a vote of confidence at his local party's annual general meeting. Mr Proctor emerged from Billericay Conservatives' best attended annual meeting ever to thank those who'd given him a vote of confidence by a majority of four to one. I, I am very grateful for the loyalty and support shown to me this afternoon by the Billerickian District Conservative Association. Almost a third of the constituency association's 1,000 members packed the small hall and heard Mr Proctor say that newspaper allegations against him were in the hands of his solicitor and he wouldn't answer questions about them. Current party officials denied suggestions that as many as 60 pro-Proctor Conservatives had joined the association in the last few days. President Ron Marshall said he had complete confidence in the MP. We have his word that they are a tissue of lies and for that uh, we obviously res respect what he has said on the matter. The party officials say they'll reconsider their support for Mr Proctor only if charges arise from a recently completed police investigation into the MP's private life. The vendetta within the INLA may be over. Twelve people have died, but now the two factions have been persuaded by two Belfast priests to stop fighting and start I'm talking. I'm certain that both parties that who, with whom Father Reed and I were in touch with as mediators want an end to the conflict. I'm convinced of that. How long do you expect this ceasefire to last? Everything human is uh, frail and uh, likely to break. But it's my hope, and I will work with Father Reed to ensure that this ceasefire lasts. The actor Patrick Troughton, best known as BBC Television's Doctor Who, has died. He was 67. He was the second Doctor, taking over the role in November 1966. He'd appeared in a number of other television programmes, including Coronation Street and All Creatures Great and Small. Patrick Troughton had a heart attack while attending a Doctor Who convention in America with other stars of the series. Greece and Turkey are still keeping their armed forces on full alert, but the danger of a military clash over oil rights in the Aegean seems to have passed. The Turkish exploration ship Sismic 1 left the port of Tanakali today with new instructions not to enter disputed waters so long as the Greeks do the same. If they go, we will go. If they touch, in that case, our ships, it will be a cause of war. But if they stay, in the territorial water, we stay. In Greece, the Prime Minister, Mr Papandreou, discussed the situation with other political leaders and said he hoped the crisis had passed. And now with the sports news, here's Michael Peshot. There was an upset in the university boat race when Oxford had an unexpected win over Cambridge. Oxford's preparations for the race were disrupted by a dispute over team selection, but today it was the weather that caused most of their problems. What a day to hold the boat race. Not a blazer in sight, the Thames looking more like the roaring 40s. Not surprisingly, the start was delayed thanks to a stormy combination of wind, rain and thunder. When the two boats finally got underway, it was Oxford at the bottom of the screen who took the advantage and never let it slip. Two months ago, Oxford were pulling in quite different directions. A mutiny amongst the crew caused some top-class Americans to leave. They were replaced by British oarsmen who today proved easily good enough. 
Cambridge's only chance at the Oxford boat would sink, but the wind had dropped just slightly and there were no mishaps. At the finish, Oxford won by 12 seconds, making it their 11th victory in the past 12 years. After all the upheavals, Oxford had reason to congratulate themselves. A bad day for Cambridge, leaving the scene quietly in the background. The even worse news for them, most of this Oxford crew were young enough to be back next year. Dave Bassett's Wimbledon side jolted Liverpool's hopes for the first division title when they became one of the few teams to win at Anfield. Bassett called it Wimbledon's greatest victory. Alan Cork came on as substitute and got the winner that beat Liverpool 2-1. Everton's Wayne Clark scored the only goal of the game to beat Arsenal and narrow the gap at the top. Tottenham still have plenty of games in hand, but if they're to make a serious challenge for the Championship, they've got to start collecting some points. Today they played Luton, who themselves are by no means out of it. Tottenham came to Kenilworth Road knowing that nothing less than a win would sustain their title challenge. But on a blustery day, defeat was in the wind. Shortly, Hill provided Harford with the sort of chance he takes in his stride. Spurs one down in six minutes. Could they weather the storm and come to grips with the synthetic pitch, never the most adhesive of surfaces at the best of times? Nine minutes into the second half, and Hill's pass to Steen then found its way to Newell. As a Liverpudlian chasing the Merseyside-dominated championship race, the goal must have given him extra pleasure. Luton's keeper Seeley tried fair means or foul to stop Chris Waddle, but the Spurs man kept his feet to pull one back. Tottenham saw a glimmer of hope there was half an hour to go. Seeley was booked. Luton, though, were never in real danger, and Hill's cross was met four minutes from time by McDonough to put Luton in third place, the leading club in the South's outside challenge for the title. Luton 3, Tottenham 1. And Tottenham's Glenn Hoddle suffered a groin injury in that game and is out of the England side to play Northern Ireland on Wednesday. So Liverpool are still at the top of the table, but their lead's now just three points and Everton have two games in hand. In Scotland, Rangers are still on course for their first championship for nine years. They had to wait for their win, though. Ali McCoy scored in the last five minutes to beat Motherwell 1-0. The Rangers winger Davy Cooper injured his collarbone and misses Scotland's European Championship game against Belgium on Wednesday. Rangers have a four-point lead. Celtic beat Hamilton 3-2. Dundee United drew one all with Dundee. And Aberdeen lost 1-0 at home to St Mirren. Halifax have reached their first Rugby League Cup final at Wembley for 31 years. They'll play St Helens for the Silk Cut Challenge Cup after a 12 points to 8 win over Widnes. Two tries in the first half sealed it for Halifax, Grant Ricks cutting the Widnes defence. This is Grant Ricks, oh he's fast now, then he's got pace, this boy, Solomon's chasing him, but I think Ricks is going to make it to the line. He does, what a magnificent try. With 10 minutes to go, Widnes made a desperate fight back. Oh, that was a good pass. Down and right to David Hume. Now then, he's out pressing Scott. He's got in into reach. McKenzie! McKenzie's going for the line! Will he score? Maybe the yes, he will! But it wasn't enough to stop Halifax reaching Wembley. The final of Rugby Union's John Player Club will be between the Holders Bath and their opponents in last year's final, Wasps. They beat Leicester 13-6, while Bath overran Oral to win 31-7. Swansea beat Newbridge to reach the final of the Welsh Cup. They'll meet the holders Cardiff, who beat Neath by 16 points to 6. There was an exciting finish to the first big race of the flat season, the Lincoln Handicap at Doncaster. As they entered the final furlong, the race was between John Reed on Star of a Gunner and Pat Eddery's mount, Mystical Man. Peter Bromley is the commentator. Far side is Mystical Man being chased by Star of the Gunner. Then comes X High and Gold Prospect and Well Rigged. The far side have it coming through on the stand side. Very, very fast indeed is made shot. But it's Star of a Gunner now that takes over in the lead. Star of a Gunner, the winner. Star of a Gunner was first at nine to one. Vague shot second. The favourite gold prospect was sixth. Prince Charles is on the second day of his visit to Southern Africa, where he's been visiting a multiracial school in Swaziland. Waterford College was set up in the 1960s in response to apartheid in the educational system across the border in South Africa. This report from Michael Burke. The Waterford girls waved carving knives around and sang about being rejected, not promising, 
The prince narrowly missed a knife up the nose. His detective was worried, but it was all part of a traditional Swazi welcome. Swazi girls, famously beautiful, carry knives to protect their honor. They said the prince had natural rhythm, but then they have natural charity. Children from 45 countries study here in a school built to prove apartheid wrong. The races mix here as perhaps nowhere else in southern Africa, barely noticing color. The prince is in effect their patron. Outranked today with the unexpected arrival of King Mswati III. A brief nod from Prince Charles excused the traditional requirement here to crawl towards the teenaged king on all fours. Then it was off in a series of motorcades to celebrations in the national stadium. More dancing, more girls, thought appropriate entertainment for royalty in Swaziland, where the king's fertility is regarded as an index of the nation's prosperity. Mswati's father had 64 wives by the time he died. Mswati has picked this girl to marry off a video of a dance like this he was sent at school. Their wedding, the first of many, is apparently imminent. And that's all from the newsroom tonight. Don't forget, clocks go forward an hour. Good night. Now the election trail turns east to Moscow, but can Mrs. Thatcher achieve anything in her talks with Mr. Gorbachev? And what did Mr. Kinnock's visit to President Reagan's White House achieve for the credibility of Labour's defence policy? Dennis Healy, who accompanied Mr. Kinnock, will be with us tomorrow. Also, Britain's six million young voters. We hear their distinctive, perhaps decisive views on defence and other election issues. That's this week, next week, tomorrow at one o'clock. Hello. March has been a cold and windy lion so far. Plenty of time yet, though, to go out as a lamb. All right, a bad-tempered, bedraggled lamb, but a lamb just the same. Now, this deep low is moving away now and taking the gales away with it. But these fronts will keep the general theme of unsettled weather going for the next few days. Indeed, there are still quite a few showers about at the moment. Some of hail, some of sleet, but becoming mainly dry in inland areas tonight. Skies clearing, temperatures dropping, uh, and there could even be a, a touch of frost in places, in spite of that uh, northwesterly wind over the country. But generally, the temperatures 2 Celsius, 36 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, a good deal of dry, bright weather through the day. There'll be some showers as well, some hail and sleet showers too, but they'll gradually die away from the west as we go through the day, although some will persist in eastern England into the afternoon. Some rain, though, getting into western districts, we think, during the course of the afternoon and the evening. That wind, that all-important wind, well, much less strong tomorrow. Still quite strong in eastern districts, but much less strong than it's been. Temperatures, too, disappointingly low as well. It tells us it's just 46 degrees Fahrenheit, and there will be that breeze as well. A summary of tomorrow, well, the main thing about that is it is going to be less windy everywhere. Good night. Over on two now, there's another chance to see the first part of the Dorothy L. Sayers mystery, Strong Poison, starring Edward Pethbridge as the famous sleuth Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Walter as the mystery writer Harriet Vane. Highlights for Sunday evening on BBC One start at 7.15 with Russ Abbott. My name's Bond, Basil and Bond. I've got letters after my name. License to kill and drive a heavy goods vehicle. Then at 7.45, the district nurse. Advertisement for the position of district nurse. I said she wouldn't waste any time. I'll make my own decision in my own time. Is that clear? Mastermind at 8.35 comes from the assembly room's derby. And for the first time, there's a husband and wife in direct competition. In That's Life at 9.25, Adrian Mills meets our youngest ballroom dancing champion. Highlights of Sunday evening's viewing on BBC One. Details in Radio Times. Back to this evening, and in 45 minutes, our young houseman is starting his training on the surgical wards between bouts of love interest and heavy drinking in the second and final part of The Houseman's Tale. Before that, here on one, a slice of life in the fast lane as we wade in waist-deep with sharpshooters Cagney and Lacey. <laughs>